So um, as mentioned, my name is Harun, and I'll be speaking about how we uh, trace crypto transactions that went across cryptocurrency ledgers. This work is done by myself, George Kapos, and Sarah Michael John, all of which are from Houston University College on. So as obviously we're speaking about cryptocurrencies, we shall first start with Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was, as, many, as they said many times before, the first cryptocurrency that was created in 2009, 2008, which was then first used in 2009, created by one of the um, synonymous authors, Satoshi Nakamoto. Now with this system, he was designed with the issue of having a pseudonymity, where that by users who transact with each other have addresses which are unique, and with that, add a layer of anonymity. But within this, you, they also mention that there are some issues with the system. First being that it's only anonymous if you keep your, your coin, your address is private. And the second is that if you leak your key, then the transactions that you have leaked can be, perhaps be linked towards you and for them going backwards and going forwards. But what they also don't mention is that if you were to, other people were to leak your information, would leak their information, that could then also be used to target you. So then not more than five years later, we see a large plethora of research which looks at attacking Bitcoin and the NMT that it provides. Many of these, of these systems use techniques like address tracking, um, address tagging, and also address clustering in order to identify the entities within the system, how they interact with each other, and the overall flow. As well as this, we've also seen many crimes happen on Bitcoin, which then use these techniques in order to determine where the coins went and how, and if they can thwart the crime in process. One of the, one of the most famous ones was the Mt. Gox hack, which, um, the very, which was the biggest exchange back in the day. Fortunately, they were hacked, lost many of their coins. But, but using these tracking techniques, we were able to find that these coins actually went to another exchange. Very recently, another exchange, Binance, was hacked, and they, they $8 million worth of Bitcoins was stolen. These are, however, being very closely monitored in case they were to move to an exchange where they could be frozen. But Bitcoin isn't the only cryptocurrency, as you all know. There are many others in this space. Um, there are some privacy ones, for example, Zcash and Monero. Over last year, Usenex and in the Privacy and Hard Technology Symposium, there were attacks that were, that were shown upon these two anonymity coins. So what I'm trying to say here is that the attacks are not only specific to Bitcoin, they're also specific to anonymity coins. Now, all of these systems and all of these attacks occur on, on chains. They occur within the same ecosystem. All well, the Bitcoin attacks occur within Bitcoin, or the Zcash attacks occur within Zcash. So that's on-chain seems to be a very studied and very looked into um, ecosystem, but we've also seen a trend of crime going across chain. This is where users move their coins from, say, Bitcoin and they buy, buy Ethereum. One of the most famous ones ones that happened recently was the WannaCry attack, which was a ransomware which infected many hospitals. And in doing so, they were able to get $142,000 worth of Bitcoin, which they then laundered through cross-currency exchanges. So the question now is, can we track exchanges that allow you to do cross-currency trades? So there are a couple of exchanges which do this, two of which we will speak about are Shapeshift and Changely, focusing mainly on Shapeshift. What these are, these are exchanges which allow you to do cross-currency trades. So you, they're like a lightweight exchange. They allow users to exchange multiple coins. You can exchange Bitcoin for Ethereum, Ethereum for Bitcoin, whatever coins you have and whatever coins they support, you can cross-trade over. In the current ecosystem, we have around 2,000 cryptocurrencies, but they combined allow you to convert over 140. So why would you do cross-trade? Well, there's many reasons. Like I said before, it's very easy to use, which I'll demonstrate. Perhaps you get some potential anonymity, which I'll explain. They're non-custodial, and that means that you don't need an, you don't really need to have your coins in our account. You just go to the website, do the trade, you get your coins back out straight away. And also, it's simply cheaper because you also do a single rate of change. So how do you do a shift? Well, it's very very straightforward. You go to the website, and you say, "Okay, I got Bitcoin, and I want to get some Ethereum." The next thing you do is you then say, "Okay, I've got." This is the ones I want to confirm. You give them the address that you want your coins to be sent to. So in our case, we want to give them an Ethereum address because we want to get Ethereum from our trade. After that, we then send them our Bitcoin to the address that they specify. Once they confirm their Bitcoins and they validate the transaction, they then will give us an Ethereum. And that's it. The, tr the trade is completely done. You've now gone across, across chain. 
So what this looks like here on the two blockchains is we've got coin A, which in our case was Bitcoin, and coin B, which can say is the transaction flow of, of Ethereum. Now in coin A, we see that we've gone from our case to perhaps a shifting service that we might know the address of. But in coin B, we don't know where that exchange has ended, where that trade has ended up with, which node did it go to, how did it propagate afterwards. So the aim of our research is to indeed find the link which can allow you to connect the currency which go across chain. These are some of the contributions that we did in our paper. And I'll go through most of them as we progress through this um, talk. The first one being the analysis that we did and how we obtained the data set in order to perform our attacks. Of course, to do, to do this attack, you first need data. And we, there was a sense there wasn't much data available, we had to go and get it ourselves. To the, so for this, we just went to the web, the URL, as you can see at the bottom, and we scraped the, trend, the API for a number of months, for 30 months, in order to d obtain a large mass of transactions. What this will give you is the following. You've got a very simple JSON, which contains four specific pieces of information. The currency input, so the person the currency wanted to send. The output coin, so the person, the currency that they wanted, you've got the amount that they had sent, and you've also got the timestamp. With these simple things, we can now figure out what was the transaction the person did on the first chain, so in our case, just was Bitcoin. So we know we've got Bitcoin, which is fine here. We know we've got a value of 0 0.51 and lots of other digits. So we go on chain. Can we find a transaction with this specific output value that happened at this specific time, give or take some blocks, was on Bitcoin, and in fact, we did find, and this is an example transaction that did occur. Then we have this transaction, what do we get? We got the user who did the, the exchange. We also have the exchange shapeshift, which was the platform the user used. Now, funny off, the, uh, the shapeshift exchange actually allow, actually will give you information about the exchange done. If you give them an address, let's say this address here, which um, the user set coins to, they will then tell you if this is correct, and if it was correct, they will return the full transaction that happened. So here we see the user got Bitcoin Cash, here 2.7 Bitcoin Cash is, and the transaction hash that was available. We just go in the blockchain, check this if this is real. If this is real, we now have the full data of the exchange and the user and when they receive the money. That's just a very simple three-step process, script the API, find the transaction, and then look, in the, look again in the API to confirm this is correct. Now, there are ways to do this without using the API, but you can read that in the paper. So now what we, I've just shown you is how to link currencies, link ex exchanges that go across chain. We now found the link and we found the shift, as to call it. So now we know how to do, how to do this attack. We looked into some of the heuristics that we could um, un understand to figure out how users interact. So of course, we first offered some more results. We scripted for 30 months, as I, as I said. We've got 2.8 million um, shifts in total. And from these, we picked the top eight coins, which are around 2.3 million transac transactions. To do this, we obviously had to go into the, run a full node, download all the data, and then pass all the data in order to be able to look into the chains ourselves. So how did we do? So we, uh, we were able to track 1.3 million transactions that went completely across chain, which gave us the input transaction and the output transaction that I had. So the best case for Zcash, we obtained around 90% of all those transactions. And for the worst case, which was Bitcoin, we obtained 76%. So we, now we know how to go through the chain. What about, what about if people try to be clever? What if they try to you know, move their coins around, try to be smart, try to obscure what they're doing? For that, we came up with two extra heuristics. The first one was called a U-turn. Now, it's, it's very straightforward, as you can see in the picture. There are two shifts, which are very close in time and proximity. In the first case, the person, for example, they have Bitcoin, they do one trade and they go into Zcash. After some time, they wait, maybe like half an hour, etc. They then do another shift and they go back into Bitcoin. The question is, how many users did this kind of transaction? And of these, can we figure out um, the values or if they had perhaps used the same coins or gone using different addresses? And then what this allows us to do is figure out the movement of coins once a user has sent money to the exchange. What did they do then after that? We found over 107,000 transactions which matched our heuristic. Of these, we found 10,000 where the person used the exact same address that they had received coins from. And, also, and of these, they used 1,000 of them actually used the exact same coins, meaning they did a complete trade going full circle. 
another case is round trip. What if a user, a user went through the circle, but in fact he did something in the bottom here between the trade, which kind of obscured what he was up to. So for that, it's very similar to the U-turn. It's two shifts, both in close time and in close value. What we're looking at here is if the, first, if the value of the first shift is similar to the value of the second shift, or if they return to the exact same input address. So did this user go from Bitcoin to Zcash, do something that we weren't sure of, and then go all the way back through, back to the original address? And the advantage over the original one here is that the identity of the person, of the original initiator is actually known, because you know this person did a Bitcoin transaction here, and he did something, and then he went through Zcash back again to his original address. Now from, from that we find around 10,000, 100,000 transactions which, which um, went through this heuristic, and of those, 10,000 actually went full circle and used the same address. So this, another reason this is important is because it helps us to identify users who perhaps use the cross-chain system as a way to mix their coins around in an attempt to obscure their transaction. So now you know how, the, how it works, you know some of the attacks that we did. We'll next we'll look into some real-world scams or a real-world scam where someone in fact did use this cross-chain in order to get away with a crime. So um, last year, in, last year late in early January, the, a firm came up called Starscape Capital. And what they promised is that if you invest in our fund, we will in fact give you a guaranteed 50% return in our special trading bot, which does lots of magic machine learning and generates a big income. A lot, of, a lot of people obviously, well, this is a good deal. They look like a legitimate company. Let's give them money. And so they did. And they raised around $2.2 million in January 2018. Then, of course, you, know, you, you can't even get 50% on the stock market. So this is, of course, a scam. And soon after they disappeared, they removed, got rid of their coins and moved it to a different address. They moved the website. They removed the social media. They had completely gone off the grid. But by looking into, a, more, into more detail, using the techniques we showed before, we identified that they actually a quarter of the Ethereum, they shifted straight into Monero. So from that, they, the API even leaked to Monero, Monero addresses that received these coins. So there are more scams in the paper which you can look into, such as many scams on Ethereum DB, which actually go cross-chain, but I will leave that out for the talk. And one of the last um, things we looked into was how users make use of privacy coins. You know, do they use privacy coins in order to augment the fact that they can go across chain? So for this, we use two currencies which we know very well. The first one was Zcash, and the second one was Dash. So in Zcash, you have this feature called the shielded pool. And what it does is you put your coins into the pool, and then they become completely hidden on the chain. You can move send them to another user. You can split your coin. You can do whatever you want. But they will be the addresses and the values that you give them will be completely hidden. So, okay, for in Zcash, how many people send money from the pool directly to this cross-chain exchange? This would mean the exchange receives coins from a place it cannot um, legitimately identify. It's an unknown area. So from that, we found around 3,800 transactions, which is quite significant, which, came, which at today's value is around three quarters of a million dollars worth of coins. Another case we looked into was Dash. So Dash, in Dash, you can do something called a coin join, where you mix your transaction with many other people, in doing so, you try to hide who you are sending your coins to. For, for the moment, all the inputs that you do are similar to the same to the output, so it makes it very, very difficult to determine who had sent um, coins to whom. For that, we thought, okay, how many people do a coin join, and of those, how many then send their money to Shapeshift? From this, we found around 2,000 transactions. Of those, one point, of those the value is currently $1.2 million worth. Now, this may seem, to, seem like to be a significant total of the volume of both of these coins. However, this usage doesn't really, we don't find that this kind of usage doesn't provide anonymity, specifically in these two coins. If we were to go back and use our U-turn heuristic to figure out how people in these ecosystems use their addresses and their coins, fortunately, people in Dash seem to use the same address quite a lot. And in fact, within our U-turns, we find it was a 64% of them, in fact, use the same address. And in Zcash, we found that those who had done a U-turn 54% of them use the same address, and of those, 28% of them actually use the exact same coins. I mean, they didn't ob obviously obtain any anonymity from using these two systems. Um, the reason for that is unclear. Perhaps they don't know how to use the system, or perhaps they just weren't sure of what, um, what was happening. Perhaps they didn't want anim anonymity in the first place. So, summary, these were our contributions. We looked into transactions that move cross-chain, 
some of our heuristics. There's a relationship heuristic which you can look into in the paper which shows you how entities within the cross-chain ecosystem operate and who are the big players there. Looked into some real-world scams. There are also more in the paper. We also looked into how people trade within the system and if any of them do fast transactions, potentially obtain money on coins from arbitrage or other ways to obtain profit. And we also showed some demos on how people who use privacy coins interact with the cross-chain system. For that, I am not finished. Thanks. <laughs> Either you have questions, or we go for lunch. Uh, hey there, great hey. talk. Uh, Artemy from the University of British Columbia. Uh, I have a question. For example, if you have you considered or have you seen transactions where they possibly change, let's say, Ethereum to Bitcoin and then used tumbling services or other privacy preserving techniques? So we, we didn't actually look into whether or not they use mixing services after. But I mean, we have the data, so there's no reason why people couldn't have this. There's no reason that prevents this from happening. Right. I, mean, but I did, but as I showed, people did use, obtain coin from like, for example, using some Z, from Zcash. Then from them, they did move their money into the pool. So this mm -hmm. is in the paper. Um, people did obtain coin from Shapeshift and then do a core joint trade after. But that we found would be significantly lower. All right, thanks so much. Okay, any other questions for Harun? Yeah. Uh, one thing I didn't quite understand is um, with Zcash, as I understand the addresses and values are concealed, how did you know the total amount and uh, uh, volume that was being transferred into these services? So Zcash, there are in fact multiple types of transactions you can do within the pool. One of them is a very private one, which, you can't, which doesn't reveal anything, which Exchange does not allow you to um, do. But it does allow you to do a uh, transaction called a de-shielded transaction, where you go from the pool into the exchange. And when you do this, you do not reveal who you are, but you do reveal how many coins you send them. And then from that, we'll be able to ta tally the total amounts. Thank you. Yo. OK, so I have a brief question. Your, um, the way you find transactions relies on timing and on, um, and on values. Yes. So, what would be a good attack against your approach? If the attackers wanted to get smarter, could, the, could they split this over multiple smaller transactions or wait you know, longer time in order to, to do the transfers? So, so there are a few ways you can thwart what we've done. One of them is to just not review the transactions. Like the, the, the exchange is very, very transparent. It's one of the um, big um, advantages. If they didn't do this, then it'd be very difficult to track. Second, the second way would be to just look into how the blockchain operates and try to mimic other users. Like if a lot of people, like for example, Bitcoin, we, when we found out that we had a much lower accuracy in determining the transaction, but this is because Bitcoin has such a high throughput that a lot of people do those values. It's hard to figure out who was who. So if they were to try to mimic that, they could obtain more privacy. But the issue then, last one, those are very advantageous. users. Will they have time to be able to look into this? And is it worth the effort to do so? Okay. Okay, let's thank all our speakers. And